Welcome to Invest in the Family Radio, a podcast about learning to invest. My name is Brian Bain, and I'm your host. At Investor in the Family Radio, we believe that every dollar and minute we spend is an investment in something, and together, we're going to make the best investments that we can, so thank you so much for joining us. Is innovation at Apple dead? Is Tesla's Gigafactory doomed to fail before it ever opens? Tech expert Mark Hibben is widely sought after by investors for his ability to bridge the world between high tech and high finance. He joins us today for a discussion on some of the latest investor-relevant information from both companies. We even spent some, spent some time talking about Apple's Project Titan. Remember, our goal here is to help you learn to invest, that's financially and in all of life. You can always find more at InvestorInTheFamily.com. If you've been investing for any period of time, you've heard of Benjamin Graham's book, The Intelligent Investor. Warren Buffett calls it by far the best book on investing ever written. If you want to be a successful investor, this book is foundational. And I'm starting a reading group focused on The Intelligent Investor and limiting enrollment to just 15 people. If interested... There will be a link to the application in the show notes of this podcast, and if you're on the Investment Family mailing list, you've already received the application, and enrollment, which is free, closes in just a few more days, so don't miss out on this great opportunity to learn from Benjamin Graham himself through his book, The Intelligent Investors, with a group of other like-minded people, and I hope you enjoy today's interview with Mark Hibben. Well, hey, Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks a lot. Glad to be here. Hey, well, honored to have you with us, and as we uh, before we get started, do you mind giving just a, a brief background on you as an investor, so our audience can have an idea of of uh, what you're up to? Yeah, uh, I'm uh, not a financial analyst or a financial planner. I, I am an engineer that, and and I really approach uh, things pretty much from a, a technology standpoint. Uh, tech companies are the the main focus of of my investment interests. Um, I've, I've picked up, uh, in the course of writing for Seeking Alpha for the, in the past few years, I have picked up uh, quite a bit of, of general sort of financial knowledge. Uh, you know, I can, I can read a 10Q. I can, I, I can pretty much understand what's going on during the earnings call. Um, so I have learned an awful lot, but I, I think I, I'm still primarily technology focused. And what I try to do is I try to relate my my observations about a company's technology to to something that you know can can be considered an an, an investor takeaway, and uh, sometimes I'm kind of fuzzy and heuristic about that. I, I, I'm not always very quantitative in terms of trying to predict, say, uh, stock you know movement in, in a stock price. I, I don't I don't try to predict um, you know specific. Uh, you know, I, for instance, I don't give a specific uh, target price for a stock. I, I never do that. Uh, I, at the at the behest of Seeking Alpha, I, I now offer you know buy, sell, hold type recommendations, but I, I usually don't go beyond that. Uh, I'm mainly just trying to give people, especially you know non technical investors, some insight into the the technology that a particular company is involved in and. And, and what the ramifications are for that company's uh, performance in the marketplace. And, and so that's what I'm really trying to do on Seeking Alpha. Excellent. Well, it's very appreciated because all the reasons you mentioned, you know, I can not, not being in the tech industry like you are, I can do all the research I want and maybe even have a decent understanding or good understanding of stuff, but I'm still not in the world. And so you being able to write as you do is very appreciated and today, his interview is going to be a little bit different than some of the normal interviews because instead of being investor focused, like a lot of the interviews have been, we'll hopefully do that with you again in the future soon. Sure. This is going to be a little more content focused because you've written several articles recently that um, I've really enjoyed and have piqued my interest, and clearly many others on Seeking Alpha have as well. Mm-hmm. Um, specifically, your article on a- Apple innovating like crazy, then um, some of other Apple's uh, um, investments with Didi. Am, am I pronouncing that correctly? Would you say it, Didi? Yeah, uh, I, maybe, maybe, maybe I, I, not. It's Chinese, but I, I believe it is uh, Didi Chusheng. Okay, we'll, we'll we'll agree to agree on that. And mm-hmm. then you also wrote the article on Tesla and their Gigafactory grand opening. So I'd love yeah. to get started talking about. So we're going to talk about Apple first, then Tesla, and then maybe have a cage match between the two companies in some ways, okay. as far mm-hmm. as pros and cons. Let's start with Apple. Your article on Apple innovating like crazy. Could you just briefly talk us through what you're what you're seeing there and what the article was about? Sure, sure. Uh, first of all, the the title is a little bit tongue in cheek. Um, it's it's basically uh, a quote from 
uh, from Tim Cook during during the uh, during the, the the earnings conference call. Uh, I I wanted to uh, sort of counteract what I see as a a, a prevailing uh, narrative in so much of the business media uh, with respect to iPhone seven. That iPhone seven. Um, and I'm just calling it for convenience iPhone 7. It's not even clear that it will be called iPhone 7. It's the next iPhone. It's whatever gets released in September. Uh, the, the narrative that we're hearing uh, over and over again is that uh, this, this iPhone 7 is going to be a- almost the same as iPhone 6S. It's not going to contain any innovation. And uh, th- that narrative has been going on pretty much since the beginning of the year. Uh, and along with that narrative about iPhone 7, there's been sort of a, a, a subtext that, well, Apple isn't really capable of innovation. And uh, the, 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 you know, for instance, there's been a, a, another rumor that related to iPhone 7 that Apple is moving to uh, a three year cadence, a three year design cadence because they, they just don't have any innovations. And I think that's complete, absolute nonsense. Uh, I, I think it reflects a fundamental superficiality that exists, at least in, in the, the part of the, of the investment business media that talks about technology companies and technology stocks. I don't see that kind of superficiality in, in the part of the media that that deals directly with technology, there's a lot of very very credible technology websites, for instance, Ars Technica, Anantech, that really do understand the technology and really do understand that Apple is is really a, an important driving force in uh, mobile device innovation. But I don't see that kind of cognizance in the business media. Well, and I can see, again, that's the value of someone like yourself coming from the tech space because there is that prevailing narrative of, for some reason, there's this ongoing desire for everyone to want Apple to fail. <laughs> Maybe because there's always, you know, when you're- You notice that. Whenever, when you're on top for so long, I guess people, you know, people don't like dynasties. And I guess in the in the stock market, Apple's been a dynasty for a little while and people wanted to get picked off. But time and time again, he's proven wrong, keeps being proven wrong. And, you know, I'm not saying that'll always be the case, but you've got the continual hate for Apple that continues to be proven wrong. And then we'll get into it later on with Tesla. It's like you have a company that is profusely loved and technically hasn't really proven much of anything yet. We'll save that for a little bit later on. Yeah. Like, yeah. Let's definitely defer that discussion. Yeah. 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 With, but with uh, Apple innovating, uh, the, the other big th- idea is that it's all dependent on iPhone and there's no arguing that iPhone is a tremendous part of tremendous profit engine for Apple. But you mentioned some other things as far as the TV, the watch and other aspects. What do you see as far as innovation product line for Apple? Well, I, I think, I think I actually watch is what I've been saying is, is probably the most important new product that Apple has and I've typically compared it to the um, iPhone in its early days. For instance, uh, one of the things that people have noted is that uh, uh, Watch in its first year of sales actually uh, has done better than iPhone in its first year of sales. So I, I think it's a little premature. In fact, I think it's very premature to declare Apple Watch a flop just because it isn't racking up you know, tens of millions of sales per quarter. I, I think that's the wrong metric to try to apply to it. I think it's it's too early in in the product development to uh, to just consign it to the dustbin of history, as it were. Which I, I'm I'm hearing a lot of people want to do that, but I want to back up just a moment to sort of answer the question about what is the core innovation that Apple is doing in mobile devices, and I, I think it pertains to uh, iPhone, iPad, uh, watch, uh, the, the core innovation that I think the, the business media uh, is consistently ignoring is the fact that Apple designs its own processors. And uh, Apple has been uh, a, 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 an important driving force in innovation in, in the industry as a result of that. 
In 2013, Apple introduced the first 64-bit processor for uh, the iPhone 5S, the first 64-bit processor for any smartphone in the world, period. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means it was just a heck of a lot faster than any competing uh, uh, processor, any competing phone. And, and, and it sent the industry reeling. And, and I don't see any, any awareness of that in, in the media coverage. Now, how does that apply to Apple's other devices? Well, they're, they're putting their custom design processors in, in all of the iPads. They're putting their custom design processors in Apple TV. They're putting their custom design processors in Apple Watch. So from that core, uh, core innovation, they're, they're spreading out into multiple product areas. That's a really, really powerful paradigm. And nobody else is doing that. Nobody is doing that. Well, and that that does make sense too, since if because most of the business media is probably coming from the consumer end, and the most consumers without a tech background obviously never look inside their iPhone and really don't care as long as it does cool stuff. Yeah, <laughs> and, and so people and think of innovation as what cool stuff is it doing, and not appreciating what you're talking well, about, which is very right. significant. Well, it, the main thing is is that is that. It, it was that processor innovation that has enabled a lot of cool stuff. Sure. And even though the cus- even though the consumers don't don't literally care about whether it's sixty four bit or thirty two bit or whatever, uh, they do care about what they can do with the phone. Right. And uh, and and what they can do with the phone uh, are are some pretty amazing things. Now, you know, you could still argue, well, you know, in the interim. Uh, the Android world caught up and, and Android phones can do a lot of amazing things too. I, I think I have a problem and, and, and this is one of the problems that I have kind of ongoing with Apple this year. <laughs> and I, and I'm, I'm, you know, even though I, I spent a lot of time talking about Apple, I'm, I'm by no means uh, um, wholly complimentary. I, I have my set of criticisms about Apple too, is, is that I, I think as, especially for this year's iPhone, uh, I don't see Apple really leveraging their their processor technology into things that consumers can see as as benefits to them directly. And I think this is a problem that Apple has. You know, yeah, you can talk about specs on on processors and, and technical things like that, uh, but but in terms of translating into things that consumers care about. I think Apple may have fallen a little bit behind the curve this year compared to Android. And, and the one area I point to uh, in, is Android N, uh, which is now called Android Nougat, which is a terrible name. I don't know why they... <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea why they settled on Nougat, except that it went with N. And they had to have something that started with N. But, you know, uh, Android N, let's call it that... Uh, has some really, really powerful multitasking features that are going to be built into every Android phone that uses it. And the processing technology that's available for, for Android phones coming from outfits like Qualcomm is really, really powerful. So they're going to be able to do some amazing multitasking things that are very similar to what you can do on iPad. Only Apple won't allow it to be implemented on iPhone. Why is that? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I literally don't know. Uh, I mean, I, I think I speculated it has to do with battery life. Um, but it, it, it still bothers me that they went that route. And I think that could be a problem in terms of perceptions of innovation with, with respect to, to the new iPhone 7. I, I think that could be an issue because there's going to be an awful lot of side-by-side comparisons and you're going to have the you know Android Android makers and Android phones touting their multitasking capability and they're going to be looking at iPhones saying see they can't do it that seems to be the theme in the last several years as far as Android versus or Samsung specifically versus Apple in that Samsung continues to roll out the very obvious customer oriented features you know, and maybe in some cases there are some bells and whistles that don't add that much value, but they're cool. But sometimes they're just really great extra value add-ons. Whereas, you know, Apple seems to have more of an approach like you described that they don't really seem to be in a hurry to do that. 
where yeah, maybe they, the focus is elsewhere. Yeah, I, I think Apple, you know, it, it's definitely true that Apple does not uh, want to be a first mover very often you know, uh, for a particular technology, that they'd rather hang back, let the competitors go out in front, learn from the competitor's experience, and then come up with a, a better version of that. And um, that does make them conservative. It does make them uh, seem a little stodgy. I, I acknowledge that. I I, I don't know how much of a problem that is because I think their their counter argument is well it 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 makes for a better user experience we're, you know we're not trying out beta software or beta features on people uh, I I think there's there's give and take there and, and pros and cons um, I wish Apple would move a little faster I get a little impatient with them sure yeah I think that's you're not alone there so the there's discussion on iPhone and then obviously watch has been the most recent notable product line rollout. We talked about that, and I agree with you that you know when the first iPhone came out, most people didn't. It really wasn't that cool. <laughs> you know, it didn't have the App Store, it didn't have GPS, it didn't have all the location technology, and they had, you, they had all these commercials trying to educate people. Hey, look, this actually does cool stuff. It took a while, and I feel like with with Watch, yeah. I, I I agree with you. I think there's still very very early in the the, pi- the the pipeline there to be making yeah. significant critiques and stuff. I mean, I'm ex- I'm very excited about the potential of that product. I, I think it has a lot of potential. Uh, the potential that I've I've claimed uh, as the direction where Apple is going to go is 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 based on what we've heard from Apple executives like Phil Schiller. You know, Phil Schiller had this uh, rather rather famous interview a while back where he talked about. Well, Apple's philosophy is to just keep packing more and more functionality in smaller and smaller devices, you know. And so, so you 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 pack the equivalent of a of a MacBook into an iPad, you pack the equivalent of an iPad into an iPhone, you pack the equivalent of an iPhone into a into a watch. And I think that's where they're going. I I think eventually it's going to become uh, the go to communications device. For an awful lot of communications that are currently done on iPhone now, specifically voice and and text messaging, uh, and I think the technology is going to be able to support that. Uh, and and by virtue of the, the the obvious proximity of of having the watch uh, on your wrist, I think people will gravitate towards using the watch that way because it's just very convenient. You don't even have to take you don't even have to take the smartphone out of your pocket. You know, you get a call, you just you know, you just turn the one, you just essentially orient the watch towards you. It comes on and you take your call and probably they'll get cameras eventually so that you can even do, uh, you know, a form of FaceTime. Right. Yeah. You also mentioned TV in your article, you know, sure. for, for a long time, you know, from consumer standpoints and stockholder standpoints, there's all this excitement about, Apple with a TV set or whatever else, whatever Apple TV would become. And that seems to have ended up not being what people were hoping would be. What do you see going on with Apple TV? And do you feel like it's been a letdown or do you think that's another un- misunderstood um, product and technology? No, uh, actually, I think the I think the market reaction was dead on. Uh, I was let down, too, um, when, when it came out last year. And then I noted in the... Um, in, in the in my article on WWDC, the Worldwide Developers Conference, that uh, Apple had made a lot of significant changes to tvOS, uh, which is a, a variant of iOS for Apple TV, and they uh, really beefed up the functionality a lot. Uh, I, I really felt that what Apple showed last year had been uh, too stripped down; that it was all it was really just a media player. Uh, with some uh, game capability, if if a developer wanted to port a game a game to Apple TV, they could do that. But uh, other than the game capability and the media playback, there just wasn't much there. And uh, now that's improved quite a bit. I, I think there's been a lot of focus also on on you know whether Apple could uh, put together. Uh, uh, an arrangement with media companies for like a so-called thin bundle of, of live uh, streaming channels, you know, a, a, a essentially a, 
uh, an over the top cable equivalent, and they and they never came through with that. And that there have even been reports that that Apple really botched the the negotiations. And uh, I can believe that Apple can be a little heavy handed with uh, and has been with uh, media companies. Uh, so I think there's still some future potential there, but um, it may be that that Apple TV always ends up just uh, being a, a a platform for other media companies' specialized apps like we already have HBO Go and, and Netflix and so forth, and that they never really get to the point of being able to field their own set of content. You know, there, there, there was some excitement at one point about the prospect of Apple going into content creation. Right. I'm not, I'm not sure that that's really such a great, great idea. Um, you know, I, I, I look at Netflix and I, you know, I'm a Netflix subscriber. I, I, I love a lot of their content, but I'm not convinced that it's uh, really paying off. And I, I think, you know, it's, it's really difficult to tell from, Netflix's financial statements, whether they're really getting a good return on on the original content. Yeah, it definitely seems that would be a shift from Apple's model because Apple really content creation, even on the uh, the software, not the software space, but like um, app space and otherwise, they they want to be the platform. So that would seem to be a bit of a shift from their philosophy. Yeah, I, I don't know that that's really you know uh, that's that's a core competence for them. I don't think it is. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it's venturing uh, awfully far afield for them. So, right. uh, so so what does the TV uh, end up becoming? Uh, you know, I th- I think it is still uh, unfortunately a niche product that isn't going to appeal to everyone. You know, I I don't use Apple TV. I had an Apple TV. I I put it up on eBay. I you know my main Home entertainment system is a is a Windows 10 PC. Wow, nice. Well, let's let's take a shift w- with regard to Apple and product lines, which seems like an insanely gigantic leap to <coughs> cars. <laughs> you know, it, 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 not, not that gigantic, considering that they, you know, there's been an awful lot of rumors about an Apple car. Well, but that's what well, in my mind that's the leap, though. The fact that they're yeah. them investing in DD, you know, that's may not be that it seemed like that big of a deal, but it, I forget when they first started talking about the idea of a car, you know, that when you're thinking iPhone to a car, that seems like a huge leap. In, oh, in I direction. think it is too. Yeah, it, it really is. And I think, you know, the latest rumors are that they're falling behind. And then, uh, one of this app, this Apple exec, uh, uh Bob Mansfield is, is now re- re- reported to be, Having been put in charge of Project Titan, the the Apple Car development project, and I, I think it is very very challenging to try to build an automobile manufacturing capability from scratch. And I've said many times that I don't think that's really a good way to go, especially since Apple has kind of gotten out of manufacturing altogether. I mean, you know, they they contract out almost everything. So why do they want to build a car? Well, I think they might actually contract out much of the car assembly process if they ever do get to the point of wanting to create a car product. Um, so, so let's transition then, I guess, uh, to um, to Tesla. Sure. Yeah. So what do you? So what do you want? Yeah, yeah. Well, can't say about Tesla except that God, they're losing buckets of money. <laughs> well, and and I think it's a good transition because. You know, Apple jumping into a car, and you already mentioned, I mean, the maybe they'll do it, maybe it'll be great, but it almost it kind of has I'm bracing for another TV type scenario as far as there's all this excitement, but then the complexity of making it happen ends up being more than anyone maybe may have expected. And yeah. and I almost wonder with a lot of tech companies, there's such a push to be you know, 15 years into the future all the time and be preparing now for 30 years from now. You know, you've got the Amazon mindset and so many other companies like Tesla who are doing that. And you, at some point, you'd start shooting too far into the future to where you can't, you, you, you can't have any real accuracy with your direction and investment with your focus. You know what I mean? So I wonder which, you know, Tesla would be probably one of the greatest examples of that right now as far as is that them or are they on target? Uh, yeah, that's a very, very good question. And, um, 
I, I don't know the answer for sure. You know, when I, when I wrote about the Gigafactory grand opening and, and what we were able to learn about the Gigafactory and what's going on in manufacturing there, um, you know, I, I kind of compared the Gigafactory to um, Howard Hughes's Spruce Goose. And I thought, I thought the analogy was actually pretty telling so let me let me lay out that analogy for for your audience a little bit. Uh, Howard Hughes, um, billionaire playboy uh, industrialist of of the 1930s and 40s, founded a company called Hughes Aircraft, which I used to work for, by the way. Wow! Nice. And um, and Hughes Aircraft got a contract from from the U.S. government in 1942 to build a gigantic transport plane that could fly across the Atlantic and uh, move massive amounts of, of troops and equipment to England and uh, circumvent the, the U-boats that were kind of blockading England back in World War II. Fantastic opportunity to do technology development. Howard Hughes is, is, was definitely a technologist, definitely into aircraft technology, he runs with this thing and he starts developing this, this enormous aircraft that actually has very little aluminum in it because it was a controlled material in World War II. So he, so he, he builds it using what amounts, what would today would, would be like a composite aircraft, like the, the, the Boeing uh, 787 except that it was all based on phenolic plastic and, and, and wood as, as the material. So it wasn't actually made out of plywood, but it was made out of this weird wood, wood reinforced plastic. It, it ends up, ended up being a beautiful aircraft, except that he didn't finish it until 1947. <laughs> and that's what I'm afraid is going to happen with, with the Gigafactory. Is that it's it's going to come too late, and it's going to be kind of overtaken by events. I it, I'm not convinced that the Gigafactory um, necessarily has the right technical approach on batteries. You know, there's an there's a tremendous amount of research going on in, in battery technology right now, and, and lithium ion batteries, uh, very very fertile active field. An awful lot of researchers are are involved in it. And almost everybody who's looking at the research out there thinks that, well, they're going to be able to more or less triple the amount of energy storage compared to today's lithium-ion batteries. And, and, to, and to explain to you what that means is that when you get to about triple the level of energy storage for a lithium-ion battery, that's about equivalent to the energy density of gasoline. So now you're talking about a car that basically has the same range as uh, as today's gasoline powered cars wow. that's a that's a that's a tremendous innovation that's a tremendous paradigm shift i mean now we're talking about driving your your tesla model s non-stop from los angeles to san francisco i mean you know that's that's really huge but is the is the gigafactory going to be able to adapt to that is the gigafactory going to be able to fold in the those innovations as as they become mature and and able to be productized uh, i'm not sure i i would not be willing to to uh yeah if i were in charge of tesla <laughs> you know <laughs> if i were if i were a, the billionaire older of uh, owner of or founder of paypal and, and spacex i'm not sure i would be willing to uh, make the investment right now in the gigafactory with the technology so much in flux hmm. and, and with so many potential disruptions that could occur. I mean, you know, you, you invest in something like the Gigafactory, you want it to, to be producing batteries until the machines wear out, which could be five or 10 years from now. Well, uh, five or 10 years from now, I'm pretty sure the technology will have evolved quite a bit. So there's all these questions about, you know, can they... Can they fold in the technology advances as they become available and mature enough to, to actually enter into product manufacturing? How much of the how much of the current 
uh, capital equipment that Panasonic is providing, how much of that will be able to be reused for future technology? I just don't know the answers to those questions. But I was pretty disappointed when I saw their, that they're going with uh, cylindrical cells for for the next, you know, for the next for for the Gigafactory and for the Model Three. Uh, I, w- I was really surprised because. Uh, it, that isn't what's going on uh, in in other areas, such as uh, the Chevrolet Bolt, uh, with their with the work that LG Chem did for for General Motors. Uh, they went with a completely different battery format. We uh, it's not entirely sure what the format is. It could be a what's called a pouch, or it could be uh, uh, what's called a prismatic cell. Those are all technical terms. People don't really care about that. But the point is, it's not it's not something that looks like your standard flashlight battery. Right. Uh, it's it, it looks like more or less a big box, like a car battery. <laughs> yeah, uh, not quite not okay. quite like a car battery. It's more like a um, a you know, to compare it to something that people are familiar with about about a medium sized book. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, tell me, tell me this. Um, you know, I think when a non-tech person, and I'll put myself in that category, you hear about the Gigafactory. Gigafactory is making batteries, making lithium batteries. So in my mind, and honestly, I don't really understand, and I haven't researched much beyond that. So, and you're talking about the concern that by the time it's up and going, it's going to be behind technology-wise. So that yeah. obviously assumes the fact that you can't just upgrade the tech. You can't just will make a new kind of battery. Like the, it's everything in the factory is going to be geared to work a certain way, and the new technology won't quite be like that. Yeah, that that yeah, uh, that's a good that's a good sort of replay of my rambling monologue about about the Gigafactory. Thank you for that. You know, sometimes <laughs> I I'm just not very concise in my. No, you're doing great. <laughs> but yeah, that's uh, yeah, and and maybe you know the the plan is. They open and they're in full full production, or at least what I call phase one production, which is to support five hundred thousand cars per year, which is a whole nother issue, whether they can actually sell five hundred thousand EVs a year. But by two thousand eighteen, the goal is to be able to support five hundred thousand car sales per year. So it's five hundred thousand battery packs or thereabouts, and uh, maybe by two thousand eighteen, the the the, their their current battery technology that they're committed to hasn't become obsolete, but they want to keep running the factory for a, for quite a while. They need to be able to keep running the factory for quite a while in order to recoup their investment. And and that's and it's that length of time where they they are producing batteries where where there's a probably a window of opportunity for some other battery technology to come in and disrupt them. Well, because I think about like an Intel or you mentioned Apple making their own processors, you know, those there's significant innovation going in processors with the, all the time and they're continuing to evolve. But obviously those companies are able to retool and continue to adapt and make the new product. I guess a similar type of retooling in, a, in the Gigafactory is not that simple is what I'm assuming from what you're saying. Um, yeah. The, well, let me let me offer first an observation about the semiconductor industry. Yeah, uh, I, I might have totally just put my foot in my mouth by not no, understanding no, no, it. No, but yeah, no, go ahead. Right, Please but, correct me if necessary. No, no, no. You you were absolutely right. I just want to elaborate a little bit on that message. Uh, that retooling is a very very expensive process. Okay, uh, it requires you know the 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 big semiconductor manufacturers like Intel as well as as the foundries that do contract manufacturing for the so-called fabulous semiconductor companies. And these are outfits like, um, like Samsung, for instance, has a foundry. And um, another company in Taiwan, uh, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, TSMC for short, um, they're spending roughly $10 billion a year to upgrade their factories because they're in this incredibly competitive push uh, to get to the next processing node in, in semiconductors. You know, there's always that big push there. Well, um, Tesla isn't going to spend $10 billion on the Gigafactory. Uh, I think they're probably only going to spend like a billion dollars, mm-hmm. at least to get to 2018. And then uh, Panasonic is going to spend something like $3 billion. So so the, 
the capital expenditures are not quite as bad, um, but the competition isn't quite as ferocious either as it is in the semiconductor industry. But you're still talking about a major capital investment. And, and I just don't know how much reuse they're, they're going to be able to get from the current investment. I, I literally, I don't, I don't know that anybody knows that. Because we, for one thing, we don't know what they're planning to actually <clears throat> put inside the cells. Um, they, uh, <clears throat> there's certainly a potential for innovation there that they're just not showing the public. Well, as, as we're wrapping this up, I, I would like to hear your thoughts. You were mentioned earlier as far as Apple and Tesla, their perceptions in, uh, I say, I'll say, the business world or the media, and then their performance, their stocks as well. You know, yeah, Apple, it seems like for years, people are always trying to, to the, the prevailing narrative is all the reasons Apple should be failing and all the reasons you shouldn't buy Apple. <laughs> and the company continues to do well and obviously continues the stock. It's ups and downs, obviously, but continues to have had been a great investment. And then Tesla seems to be on the other side of things where, you know, if you say something negative about Tesla, you've got to make sure your address is nowhere on the Internet because someone may <laughs> send you some <laughs> negative mail or something. You know? And uh, but at the same time, technically, they haven't proven anything. I mean, they've got a great car and it's beautiful and I would not have a problem having one in my driveway. But from a... But from an investment standpoint, there is Apple has proven time and time again. Tesla continues to be a huge question mark. What I don't even know what you're investing in or that kind of stuff. But how do you what do you make of all that in your mind? Well, um, yeah, that's I I think this is almost a subject for for another discussion. Cool. Well, I can, we can do that too. We can do that too. We yeah, can, I, we can leave I, everyone hanging. I mean, no, I don't want to leave everyone hanging. I, I want to go ahead and, and try to address it as well as I can in you know, like a few minutes. But um, perception is, <clears throat> unfortunately, uh, er, almost everything. It's not quite everything uh, in terms of, of the market's valuation of the companies. Um, I, I think the, market, um, the market's a little superficial when it comes to technology. And so they, they, they tend to, I think the market tends to get manipulated, um, by clever media campaigns. And, um, Apple, <clears throat> Apple isn't doing that. Uh, I don't think Apple is trying to manipulate the media. Uh, they, they present their products. There's, uh, there's, okay, there's a certain amount of public relations that goes on with that. Um, but I, 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 I think Apple's uh, one of the more transparent companies. For instance, uh, they every every year, I mean not every year, every quarter they publish their uh, their their sales figures for iPhone. Uh, no one else does that. Hmm. You know, there there wouldn't there, it wouldn't be possible to have this narrative about peak iPhone if it weren't for the fact that Apple is publishing hard numbers every quarter. How many devices they sell? How many iPhones? How many iPads? How many Macs? No, no other company does that. And I think to, to some degree, familiarity has bred contempt because um, it's so easy to believe uh, a certain amount of spin doctoring that, that goes on uh, when you don't have hard numbers. <laughs> and uh, I, I, think, I think Tesla... Tesla is not. Tesla is certainly publishing hard numbers. They're they're publishing how many cars they make, how many cars they deliver. I think that's very commendable. That's that's very good um, transparency on their part. But on the other hand, they keep throwing up all these weird financial metrics that nobody really understands. I don't understand them. Core business free cash flow. What does that mean? <laughs> nobody really knows except that. Uh, they were only able to show positive core business free cash flow for one quarter, and then that that metric got tossed aside because in the latest quarter it was negative again. So uh, they're you know it's pretty clear they're losing money. They're losing a lot of money, and they're relying on their on their capital raises to keep going. and And I think one would have to be concerned about uh, how 
you know, how, how long can they really keep going? I, I believe, based on what I saw with the Gigafactory, that they can at least keep going to 2018. So if they, if they, make, if they manage to make the Model 3 and put it into mass production by 2018, they may be home free. Hmm. And I think a lot of people are, are kind of assuming that. But, you know, in terms of market perception, I think for Tesla, it, it's all about Elon Musk's mission. You know, the mission right. to, um, to, to halt global warming and save the planet. What, what could be more noble sure. than that? And I think a lot of investors are really find that appealing, along with the fact that, well, he's doing some really cool stuff. I mean, landing sure. rockets on their tail in the middle of the ocean on a, <laughs> on a barge that's moving up and down. Uh, you know, uh, how cool is that? building self-driving or semi-self-driving electric vehicles that look absolutely marvelous. I mean, I, I think he's got sex appeal. Tim Cook doesn't really have the sex appeal. And I think the market is just gravitating that way. And, and I think that's about all I, I want to say for now. I, you know, I, I, I often have a lot of problems with Mr. Market. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, when people point to market moves or stock price moves as validation of their opinion. I just kind of, uh, you know, my eyes glaze over and, and I, just, <laughs> you know, I just don't, I, I, I just don't think it's important. Well, that, uh, that, that tells not. me that you're, you're worth listening to. So I like that. <laughs> well, I, maybe I am. Um, and you know, I, I've learned an awful lot in the past couple of years writing for Seeking Alpha. I'm certainly a much better uh, investor than I was before I started writing. You know, because the writing forced me to really think about these companies and really do my homework. Mm -hmm. And and I think um, I wasn't doing that before. And I think most most individual investors aren't aren't doing that because. They have lives, you know, they have careers and, and, and families and, and, and pursuits and, and they don't have the time to invest, to really understand these companies. And I think, unfortunately, if you're going to be a self-directed investor, I think that's what it takes. And I, I know that may not be an encouraging message for, for your audience, but unfortunately, that's, that's, that's what I feel I've learned from my experience. Well, that's great wisdom. And honestly, that's a message that I like to go out through uh, this podcast and our other, our other media resources is that there's, I think it's helpful to have that sobriety. And that doesn't mean someone uh, needs to abort the entire process, but you need to be sober when you approach the process. You need to have systems in place. You need to have safeguards in place against your emotions and against your impatience. And all of that stuff, and obviously that can be a whole other conversation and one that I would very much enjoy having. But sure. No, I, I am glad to hear you say that because I think somewhere in – there's a nexus or a crossroads of all those things where I think there is a healthy place to be as an investor. And the whole reason for the show is to help our audience to get to that point. So those sure. comments are always welcomed. Yeah, sure. I, I mean, I'm not saying – I'm not saying – I'm not trying to tell people not to do it. I'm just saying it's hard. Right. <laughs> you know, it's really hard and you really got to take it seriously. Well, Mark, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for giving us, giving us this time this afternoon. And uh, we'll look forward to do doing it again sometime. Uh, by all means. Yeah. Uh, more the merrier. I'm, I'm more than happy to oblige. Uh, I had fun. I had fun. I Good. really, enjoyed, I really enjoyed chatting with you. And so let's do it again. Awesome. I hope you enjoyed today's interview with Mark Hibben. Remember, you can get full show notes with links and other details at investinthefamily.com. And if you want to be a part of my special, The Intelligent Investor Reading Group, don't forget to fill out the application. There's a link on the show notes of this podcast, either at investinthefamily.com or in iTunes or any number of other places. If you're on the email list, you've already got an email with the application on it. Don't forget to apply, and hopefully I will see you there. This is Brian, and thanks for joining the family. The information and opinions contained on this podcast are for educational purposes only. The information does not consider the economic status or risk profile of any specific person. The information and opinions expressed should not be construed as investment trading advice and does not constitute an offer or an invitation to make an offer to buy and sell securities. 